Hey, it's Mike here, and today, VO2 maxing. Really how to boost your VO2 max according to science, even looking at some more obscure ways of doing it. You might've heard of looks maxing, different methods to make yourself look more attractive, like mewing, which is facial exercise, or gua sha, which is those facial massage stones. But today we're talking about VO2 max, which is a measure of your cardiorespiratory fitness because it is highly correlated to longevity. And I was curious about mine and wanted to do an old fashioned low technology test. So I did a one and a half mile run for you guys to get a pretty solid estimate, but stay tuned for that. And we also of course have the science on different methods and some of them are kind of out there. Some of them are higher effort, lower effort, higher time, less time, etc. And a poll of mine showed that 92% of you guys wanted more exercise science content. So Let's go. Your VO2 max is your maximum rate of oxygen in terms of volume, that's the V, when you are physically exerting yourself. Well, it can be measured just in like how much output you're putting out in your absolute VO2 max. That's usually adjusted for weight to a relative VO2 max. That's what most people are using. And the gold standard for this would be a treadmill test where you have the tube in your mouth and they're measuring all of the gases coming in and out of your body. But there are also some pretty accurate other ways of measuring it. For example, the one and a half mile test. So I actually went out to a track and tried running this just to get my baseline and we'll see how I did. Did I do moderate or excellent or elite? <laughs> and while I do play sports regularly, I'm not a huge runner these days, so we'll see. But lightning fast, we have to cover this longevity data because it is pretty insane and you need to know it to be motivated like me. This is what motivated me. First of all, we have this study on cardiorespiratory fitness, which found that compared to those with lower fitness, the elite people had 80% less mortality over the course of the study and elite was categorized as doing better than 97.7% of people on an exercise treadmill test. Oh, and 80% is ridiculously lower. That is lower than pretty much any mortality rate of anything I've seen in any study. And it is worth saying, you know, some of that 80% reduction in mortality could be picking up reverse causation. People with some serious chronic illness are of course not gonna have as good of a VO2 max perhaps from that illness, but there's clear causation in terms of cardiovascular health. It is worth mentioning that the people in the elite group Group and the high group did not have a massive difference in longevity. But it makes sense, as we age, our cardiovascular system just naturally declines. And we can see that VO2 max declines as well with age. And as this chart from a study mentions, we really have a rough 17 and a half milliliters per kilogram per minute cutoff that determines whether you're physically independent or dependent on others. Of course, that's not set in stone, but it's worth noting. So in a sense, VO2 max has a reasonable relationship to whether or not you are disabled into older age. And of course, we don't wanna just increase lifespan, we wanna increase health span as well. And it is interesting just to look at the expected amount of blood that your heart is gonna be pumping and oxygen that is gonna be delivering as a result. We're talking about untrained healthy adults having a heart stroke volume of about 100 milliliters liters per heartbeat with your endurance trained athletes at around 150 and your elite athletes up to about 200. So a twofold difference between different humans. And unfortunately, we have a lot of sedentary people. We have sedentary lifestyles in the West here. So we have to put a little extra effort into this. So it's all about getting that heart pumping so we can look to methods to increase it. And right off the bat, a good one is to just open your bills. That'll really get your heart pumping. You know, maybe pay some taxes. That'll do it. Get Drive some traffic. I'm just kidding. All right, now let's get into different types of training and this is where you're gonna be able to make quick gains potentially if you are willing to put in the work and we have that sort of keystone study. We're talking about long distance or lower intensity training versus hit that high intensity interval training. And we have four different groups here. And we can see from the chart here that LSD is not a good thing to do for your VO2 max. No, LSD stands for long, slow distance running. You know they could have found a different acronym, but those scientists like to be all edgy. Anyway, we also have LT there, which just stands for 85% of heart rate max, which is the lactate threshold. And then we have the two different types of hit. We have 50 15 by 15 interval training, which is 15 seconds of running at 90 to 95% of heart rate max, followed by 15 seconds of active resting. I don't know what active resting is. Is it just like sitting there and fidgeting really hard? Anyway, and then the fourth is four by four minutes of interval running, which is four minutes of running at 90 to 95% heart rate max, which is intense, followed by three minutes of active resting. And by now you're getting the picture that the four by four crushed it. Both of the hit workouts did better, but that one did best by far in terms of VO2 max, the white bar. But yeah, that's also just training 
really hard. Imagine running at 95% of heart rate for four minutes and doing that four times, four rounds. And this later meta-analysis did corroborate this, saying that, yeah, endurance training and HIT both elicit large improvements in VO2 max of healthy, young to middle-aged adults with the gains of VO2 max being greater following HIT when compared to endurance training. So it is worth mentioning from that previous study that really the jogging there was for people who already were moderately trained. So if you had somebody who was sedentary, that would certainly increase VO2 max. But in that case, it didn't. However, we have several studies showing that endurance training also increases VO2 max, just not as well as HIT. We have some more niche forms of training for VO2 max, but I wanna hit on the mechanisms for HIT really quickly because they're fascinating. First of all, mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell. We can see from studies on HIT training like this one, it increases the efficacy and the number of mitochondria within your muscle cells, which is fascinating. More power in the house. So that's mitochondrial biogenesis. And another one is the stroke volume of your heart. We can see from that previous study, we had that white bar, which was VO2 max, but then we also had another bar, which was stroke volume in people. And we can see it going up. This is the amount of blood that is gonna be pumped by your heart. This is straight up heart strength. This is delivery of oxygen to your muscles and more. And so that just makes sense. That's just almost like one in the same. And the other one is muscle oxygen utilization efficiency going up. And this could play a role with the mitochondria. And in the realm of longevity and metrics, I figured I would introduce the Hume Band U. Maybe familiar with the Hume Body Pod, which looks at a bunch of body composition metrics. And we're not just talking about another fitness tracker here. We're talking about another way to meet longevity goals because it can integrate all the information it's getting from this band as well as the body pod to calculate interesting things such as your metabolic momentum. The more metabolic momentum, the slower you're gonna age, the less metabolic momentum, the faster you're gonna age. And that's calculated from your habits like exercise, sleep, et cetera. And then it also looks at metabolic capacity, which you can view as your body's energy battery. And those are available for free in the app. And you also have a bunch of other metrics from the band itself. Of course, you have things like sleep and oxygen level and heart rate variability, which I was happy to see was really high for me after tracking for weeks. And then another one that's really interesting is the chronic illness early detection feature that they have is an AI powered way to say, hey, there's something that looks a little bit off here. You might have a higher risk or a lower risk based off different metrics. Mine warned me that I'm chronically online and need to get off all devices. I'm joking. And if you are interested in it, you can of course click the link below and use the code MikeTheVegan20 to get 20% off your Hume band. And that's only valid for seven days. And I will say that this band is HSA slash FSA eligible. So you can get it covered for free if you have those accounts. All right, back to the video. But what's happening is that you are literally becoming better at using the oxygen that you have after HIIT training and of course after endurance training as well, but more so with HIIT. But it also increases the activity of oxidative enzymes, which is of course gonna increase oxygen utilization. All right, now let's get to the lesser known types of training. And the first one here is blood flow restriction or obstruction training, also known as katsu. And this is pretty anime. We're talking about like strapping some elastic bands to your limbs, you know, restricting the blood flow in particular from your veins so your arteries can still deliver it, but your veins have a harder time doing so, getting it back to your heart, and this leads to a unique type of strain. But in particular, this is good for somebody who might be a little bit more lazy because we see pretty good VO2 max gains even with just like walking, walking or cycling in a light fashion. This study found that cycling at just 40% of VO2 max with blood flow restriction increases VO2 max better than without it. But the crazy part, the people without it trained for three times as long at the same intensity, 14 minutes versus 45 minutes, but the blood flow restriction ones got better results. And even just walking with blood flow restriction increases VO2 max and those 1.5 mile run times. Although a review of studies on athletes does raise alarms about the risk of bias in that blood flow restriction research. And this is used in weightlifting perhaps more. And the interesting part is studies on that and the official technique aren't even lifting as high of weight. We're talking about like 40% of max and they're still finding pretty amazing results even with muscle hypertrophy. And so that's fascinating to me. And this is creating a low oxygen environment, oh, sort of mimicking working out at altitude just within your limbs. The only thing I see as a potential risk, and I think we just need more data on this, is it sort of reminds me of those women using booty bands and getting a lot of complaints of like burst capillaries and spider veins and, and blood vessels, things like that. So 
I feel like if people who are prone to that, that might be an issue. But that brings me to the next one, which is a bit more known. I just mentioned it, the altitude-based training, but also simulated altitude training. Of course, not everybody can go and train at like the Olympic facility in Colorado, but there are things like masks, which to me seems really uncomfortable, but if you're willing to do it, they got these sort of hyperbaric style masks, restrict oxygen flow, and can make your body work harder, and then increase VO2 max in a similar way to working out at altitude. And this works in an interesting way Basically, when your body detects that you have less oxygen, it creates more erythropoien, which is a hormone that increases red blood cells. So higher red blood cell count means more oxygen delivery, and then therefore you can get a higher VO2 max. However, it is worth mentioning that studies that are on true altitude training show better results than studies that are sort of artificially restricting breathing, for example, because it's not actually lowering the oxygen content of the air. It's just making it a little bit harder for you to get oxygen, and so not quite as good. But for somebody like me, at like zero sea level in the Midwest here in Iowa, uh, it seems like a good bet. And then another lesser practiced method is training your respiratory muscles themselves. And this can be done a few different ways. It's really anything that's gonna be working, your breathing muscles, these intercostal muscles, these lung sort of surrounding muscles. However, I will say that the results are mixed on this. For example, we had one study using a sort of breathing restriction tube device, and that showed increased VO2 max, but then another study did not show any increased VO2 max. So hit or miss, or maybe you need better devices. All right, now let's get to my one and a half mile test. You might be asking, why not just a one mile test? Well, we actually had a study that compared true VO2 max measurements to a one and a one and a half mile test and found that the correlation quotient was higher for the one and a half mile test. We're talking about 0.79 for the one mile and 0.84 for the one and a half mile test, which is really a high level of correlation. And so for me, I just found a standard track that would be six laps for one and a half miles. But yeah, here's me trying to run this. All right, so Mike the Vegan in the field here, really the track and field, but it's really hot and sunny. It's like, feels like 90 degrees right now. So this was really stupid. But basically in order for me to have an excellent VO2 max, I gotta run this thing in like 11 and a half minutes. If I'm amazing for my age at 35, I could do 10 minutes and 15 seconds or less. That's probably not gonna happen, but I just have to run six laps here and I have to do about a minute and 55 seconds per lap. So I'm gonna try to pace myself and this might go horribly wrong. So let's go. All right, so I just finished my first lap. It's a minute and 30 seconds too fast, which is stupid, but we'll see how it goes. All right, mile, four laps, just under seven minutes. We'll see how the pace goes, it's getting hotter. I'm realizing I didn't really warm up. All right, it's my final lap. I think I'm just gonna push it a little bit. See how it goes if I can break 10 minutes 30. Maybe I would if I wasn't talking so much. That was pretty rough. I also couldn't unlock my phone fast enough at the end, so it was like 10.32 by the time I stopped, so I'm gonna have to look back at the footage, but better than I thought I'd do. Time for some water. And I will say I looked at a chart before this and I was, so I was trying to hit like 10 and a half or 11 and a half for different tiers of results, but a lot of the charts show different things. The best one that I found was this one, which at least cited research. And I am happy to say that I did end up in the excellent category, even for 18 to 19 year olds, which is sweet as well as of course, in your 30s, and I gotta shave off about 30 seconds to be in that 2% or higher category. So I got some work to do, but I'm happy I found a starting point. So maybe I could break that if it was colder and I practiced a bit more. And using online calculators, my VO2 max is about 50, which you know I'm happy with for my first test. I wanna cover a topic that is often ignored and that is diet and VO2 max. We have a bit of a lack of studies on this. And while I would love to see more studies directly on different food types and even process versus unprocessed foods, things like that. We at least have some dietary pattern ones. And we have at least three studies on sort of plant-based diets for VO2 max. And we have two of them that are vegan versus meat eaters. And the first is this elite athletes one that were vegetarians versus meat eaters. Just the vegetarian women had higher VO2 max statistically significantly. However, the men trended higher as well. 
than the meat eaters. So interesting finding doesn't mean all that much, but we can fast forward to a 2020 study. And this is just on moderately trained people. And they looked at VO2 max and they found that vegans had a significantly higher VO2 max. We're talking about 44.5 versus 41.6 on average for the meat eaters. And they also had a better time to exhaustion. So they lasted longer before they got exhausted, which is really interesting. Eight, and that's pretty dramatic at 12.2 minutes for the vegans and 8.8 .8 minutes for the omnivores. And it is important to note that VO2 max is a function of weight as well. And so just losing weight would increase your VO2 max theoretically. And that makes us wonder, could it just be some weight loss from this group? Well, no, because they actually found these people and they matched their BMI. So it wasn't statistically significantly different. And again, we have that higher endurance as well. And now we have a very recent 2025 study that largely inspired this topic. It was actually a vegan soccer trial. So they call it the veg in sock study, which just makes me think of a bunch of carrots and vegetables inside of a sock, not soccer. Or maybe it's pronounced veg in sock, which would be probably what more people want would be socking vegans in the face as a study. That would probably get some good hits on Daily Mail. So they took people that played soccer and they had them go on a control program or a program with a vegan diet and the results are interesting. By the end, the vegan group's VO2 max was 57 and the control groups was 51.6. That is quite a difference. And again, we're talking about people who were already soccer players, which have high VO2 max in general. And then they say it could be due primarily to the weight loss though. Is that valid? Yeah, they say they lost nearly two kilograms of weight and that is part of the equation, but they once again found that the endurance was significantly better. I mean, look at this chart in that vegan group people put onto a vegan diet had a higher bar there by quite a bit. And we also see a trending increase in their absolute VO2 max. So the one that is not related to weight, it's not statistically significantly different, but it makes you wonder, you know, if the study were bigger, would we have found something there? So I don't think it's fair to completely conclude that it's just from some weight loss, but yeah, you get it. But then just to be fully transparent on funding here, this was, as they say, partially funded by Oatly Germany, which is of course a wing of the oat milk company. However, they claim that Oatly had no say in the study design, data collection, data analysis, or writing of the manuscript for the veg in sock study. You know, so these university researchers would have had to be willing to just straight up lie for Oatly. You can come to your own conclusion there, but move this back. So what could be a mechanism for a vegan diet actually increasing VO2 max? And we could speculate for a long time here, but perhaps the main one, especially in a short several weeks long trial, like the soccer one, is very likely increasing arterial function, increasing artery dilation, and perhaps delivering blood flow more effectively. You know, there might be some inflammation related thing. We see lower inflammation in people put on a randomized, and we see lower C-reactive protein, major inflammation marker on people put on a vegan diet from, from randomized trials. So maybe that plays a role. Other than that, in the longer term, of course, the less artery clogging, the less plaques that you would have, the better off you're gonna be. And of course we have lower LDL or bad cholesterol levels in vegans. And LDL is causally linked to atherosclerosis using genetically randomized or Mendelian studies. I've said that a thousand times, I'll say it a thousand times more. All right, so hopefully your brain has been VO2 maxed out on all this new information. I know I learned a lot looking at this and just trying to see my VO2 max and how VO2 max equations work, et cetera, like that. Very interesting to me. So yeah, once again, VO2 max and longevity highly connected. 80% lower mortality over the course of that one study for people with the highest treadmill test results, which is pretty mind boggling. And then we also just have the diet connection there. So we now have multiple vegan diet studies showing higher VO2 max, which is pretty astounding. And whether that's short term artery function levels or even artery clogging being lowered by plaques in the long term. I would love to see a study on that one, but clearly there's some benefit going on. And then we also have those different techniques. Obviously hit is better, but if you don't think you can do a four by fours at 95% heart rate, maybe if you're somebody that won't react negatively to those bands for the katsu training, I mean, that looks pretty cool. I might try that. Or is it gonna freak people out in the gym? I mean, it is kind of kinky, it's sort of like you're tying yourself up, like you're about to do some illicit drugs, but you're actually just trying to get buff. I don't know, but if I do it, I'm definitely 
definitely listening to anime intros while I work out. And along the lines of longevity, if you wanna look at more longevity metrics and get the Hume Band, you can just click that link below and use the code MikeTheVegan20 for 20% off your Hume Band for the next seven days. All right, let me know down below what you think about all this. Have you been working on VO2 maxing already? Do you have any good tips and tricks, hacks that you can share below? I'd love to hear them. Other people would as well. So of course, feel free to like, subscribe, all that good stuff. And I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.